Today's guest is Dr. Allison J. K. Her last name is K A Y. So, and she said it was okay to call her Dr. Allison, but she is so interesting and she has such a vast amount of knowledge and uh, uh, just a, a life journey that is very, very interesting. Uh, living overseas in Taiwan for 10 years, for example, and really, and doing teaching, but also learning. Uh, and so, yes, she's an award-winning number one international best-selling author. She has uh, written four books. Uh, she's also the founder of the Vibrational Upgrade System. And she is uh, 20 plus years teaching, working and teaching in yoga, meditation, energy medicine, mind body fitness, longevity, and holistic health. And with a specialized focus on the chakra system, which she talks a little bit about towards the end. The first part of this episode is a lot about her journey from, you know, childhood to really what led her to going over into Asia. And so she started in Boston, went to San Francisco, went to Tampa, and it's just very interesting what led her to each next step. Uh, and then with each step, continuing her collection of knowledge by uh, going to school, she finally got her PhD uh, when she lived in Florida and then went over to Asia. And of course, where the learning continued, because can you imagine being being taught and being in a place, uh, you know, that where where a lot of this stuff really kind of Chinese medicine and uh holistic healing. I mean, kind of the origins of it over in that area of the world. And so, yes, she is very fascinating. Uh, and I, I, we actually talked about her coming back on because so much of it was, uh, of the episode was her backstory. And then we got to the juicy part towards the end. <laughs> I don't feel like we ended up covering enough stuff. Uh, we ran out of time. All right. So I hope that you enjoy this episode and this interview with uh, Dr. Allison as much as I enjoyed meeting her and talking to her about uh, her vast expertise. Welcome to another episode of Not Your Average Lives. And my guest today is Dr. Allison J. K. So J is in the middle initial and K, K A Y. We have a friend named JK. So it's really funny that you, that's your name. So, yes. Yeah, so we're going to have an interesting conversation because Dr. Allison does things that uh, not a lot of my guests do. And so I think it's going <laughs> to, yeah, I think, I think it's so, a, well, maybe they do it and they just don't know it, but it seems like you have more uh, gifts in this area. But she has secrets no one else uses to upgrade, inspire, and disrupt old paradigms. And so, and she has a community uh, and they're, they're called Vuppers. I love that terminology. Yes. And so Allison, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Allison, and ask you to explain what a Vupper is. Uh, it's the acronym for vibrational upgrade. It's a yeah. system that I, I created um, after living in Asia for 10 years and already having run energy medicine in holistic health and wellness sessions alongside my classroom teaching and administration career. So the community, like my free community on Facebook is vibrational upgrade. Um, so we just call them buppers, the tribe. Yeah, I love that term. It's a, it's a cool term, very unique. Yeah, so let's talk about your life in Asia. What took you to Asia? So I know that um, it's typical to look for like that shift that changed my life. Um, and I've always been this way. And, and it, it, I grew up walking out in the woods that um, surrounded my home. I was lucky enough to live growing up about 30 miles southeast of Boston and surrounded by forests and woods. And, and my older brother and I would tromp through the woods every day after school and on the weekends. And he'd be in front of me, like jumping on dead tree limbs and breaking them, you know, with the boy antics. And I'd be like, just connecting with everything, <laughs> you know, and just really feeling a part of it all. And I, and I didn't realize that until later, you know, because I just was so immersed. I didn't say to myself at age six, I'm connecting with everything. I just felt not separate. I just felt like I was part of the trees and how do I, what would I mean? Like the trees could talk to me, like, like the trees were alive and they had an existence that wasn't separate from mine. And so then in my teen years, I, per nobody's guidance, just started to write in a journal. And I realized later when I stepped into meditating and then teaching meditation that I was learning how to connect with my higher self. 
So then, uh, now did your brother, like as he was hopping on dead trees and you were kind of like communing with the trees, like, did he, what, did he have anything like, was he different or was he not as connected to nature as you were? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's why I, I, I differentiate that he was jumping on the dead tree limbs. Like he was doing the typical active boy yeah. antics, you know? Um, and, and, and like, I would be by the Creek and I'd look at the little dragonflies and the critters like fluttering right above the water. And, and, and then like at the clovers on the um, forest floor. So it wasn't just the trees. It was just everything. So I don't think my, my brother wasn't disconnected, but it wasn't the same. Yeah. You were, you were yeah. so connected. Yeah. That's it. And then that, that you remember that so it's like such a detail that you remember. Well, check it out. So later on, um, so I went into my bachelor's because I have a PhD. I went into my bachelor's as a psych major. So around like age 13 ish, my mom and I were sitting out back on the swing that we had. And she said to me, Allison, you know, you are so good with people and understanding them. You might want to consider going into psychology. And so, you know, I, I, I was like, wow, okay, that feels, and I felt it out and, and, and seemed aligned. And so that was my first major. And by three semesters in, I was like, so mind you, I had taken my very first semester, an elective all semester long in yoga, second semester, an elective all semester long in personal training, both of which I, I carry certification in now. Um, so by the third semester of being a psych major, I was like, man, you just are not answering my question of how do we be the happiest, most thriving versions of ourselves here? And so I switched majors and I, I, I focused a bit on learning what advertising and does to our mental framework and how we look at the world um, and the impact that societal conditioning has on us. And then I took another major, social thought, political economy. So that explains itself. And so then I ended up landing in English literature because it was a study of soci society or sociology, humans or psychology in consciousness, but through an art form. Mm -hmm. So I graduated with that and I moved out West to San Francisco and I had to write stories instead of taking my GREs to get in for my master's in creative writing, which was my focus of the English lit. And so um, I serendipitously got offered a job in politics as a political organizer. And I just took off, really hit my stride because the strategy was brilliant. It was to get people elected to state California and federal Congress that would write, not just say yes and vote, but would write legislation that protected the environment. So here was something I loved already and yeah. intuitively, innately understood the need to protect and nurture it. And so meanwhile, I was also like going to Native American medicine wheel ceremonies and, and, and still staying and then going to the Chinese, the Chinatown rather in San Francisco, which I think is the best one in our, the United States, the Chinatown in San Francisco. And I bought like the I Ching and learned like the old Taoist philosophies. Um, and, and, and that's not something somebody does at age 19 and reads the I Ching. I mean, it's, it's pretty in depth. So I was still exploring holistic stuff, but okay. Fast forward, I hit my stride. I, I, I got put on like really intense campaigns. The first one was down in LA and I was, I helped to get elected the first Latina woman to the California state assembly. And she wrote legislation that passed ultimately to save the last bit of green space in LA. So great success, Allison, rah, rah, go team. And I go back up to San Francisco and then they go to put me in the general elections in an even more intense race where it was up in the Sierra Nevada as a developer against a person who would protect. And uh, I was stressed. The success caused stress. And so I was walking through a bookstore and this purple book lumped, like, leap, leapt off the shelf. Lavender is what I was also trying to say. It's more lavender mm -hmm. and um, stopped at my feet. And I'm not even overstating that. Like it, it fell off the shelf and I, if I could have, I, I could have just stepped on it, but I'm not like that because of books. I love books. You know, I was an English lit major. So I picked it up, it was on meditation. So I learned to meditate. And so, okay, uh, fast forward, season ends, uh, election season ends. I had, that, I had had that job for about two and a half years. I had bypassed the master's in creative writing because I had, realized, oh my God, is this for me, the work I was doing as a political organizer. So once the campaign season ended successfully, I said, woohoo, and I, I went overseas uh, for six months, uh, backpacking throughout Western Europe and lived on a Greek island for a month, uh, lived in Israel, uh, made it over to the Middle East, lived in Israel for a month. 
and I had already lived um, outside the country as an exchange student in um, my senior year in Venezuela. So this wasn't my first bout outside the United States. So I came back to the States and my parents moved to Florida. So I, I came back and went to Florida and got my master's in public administration, public policy, focusing on environmental policy. So fast forward, I'm getting out with my master's. In the last year, I learned my first form of energy medicine. Whilst I had also, alongside my master's, been teaching to in the community center meditation to adults. And I was uh, implementing what I had learned working with Native Americans in medicine wheel ceremonies by, I, I, I did the first Audubon Society's internship where I was shown out in the field, the different birds, and as a, a trained naturalist, how to interpret the different birds, how to identify them. And so then I was given the charge of taking people on a boat tour outside of Tampa Bay to this island in the middle of Tampa Bay that bird, migratory birds would come on and nest. And so the boat was only so shallow uh, because the water in Tampa Bay is shallow. The boat had a special motor and that motor the dolphins loved. So the dolphins would always come up and play with us and really interact with us um, on the tours. And so I was a trained and am a trained naturalist with the Audubon Society. And I incorporated what I learned about animal symbolism from the Native American work I had done. So then as I'm graduating my master's, I also launched like this side gig of taking people on canoe and kayak treks up the freshwater rivers and pointing out the birds. And then- So the different than what you were doing in San Francisco. Like to me, what you're doing in Tampa aligned more with what your childhood and what you wanted to do. But you did, you learned kind of like, well, the advertising, I guess, work that you learned, like how to, how to get people's attention through advertising that probably really helped you in that career, you know, selling people to win elections. Uh, and I love the cause behind it. Cause you know, I think that why as to why you're doing it really helped you, but such a different world. Yeah. I imagine you're outdoors all the time in Tampa and you weren't probably outdoors a lot. I don't know. So different. No, I've always, so I've been doing cardio workouts since 13. Mm. And so I've always, I've been cross country in high school. So I, I've kept up the hiking outside and going to the mountains and, and, and skiing and, and being an outdoor girl. But um, yeah, I hear you. And it, but I was also in the classroom getting my master's. And I was also working at a restaurant to pay for my master's. And then I did this internship and I was helping uh, the man I was living with raise his teenage son from his um, the divorce he now had had at that time from his marriage so i was busy yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um i so I, in the as i was graduating though i so what i'm saying is i kept up the focus on policy that will protect the environment with my masters and meanwhile i was teaching meditation i was bringing in the mystical through like interpreting the birds out on the the, the, the treks that i organized after i got trained with the audubon society and I was, um, I, I then learned my first energy medicine modality. So I graduated and I, I was like, okay, where can I affect the most change inside the system or outside? So I went for both. I went for local or federal EPAs, governmental agencies for protecting the environment. And then I also looked at NGOs and nonprofits. And um, you know, that feeling when nothing takes track, nothing has traction where doors aren't opening and there's a lot of pushing and forcing and sense of making things happen. So I knew to, I knew to step back because that was what was happening. I mean, I was having fun. My boyfriend at the time would come home from work every day and I'd ask him, Hey, how about Alaska? Or, Hey, how about Montana? Like I just <laughs> looking at the different job opportunities. So nonetheless, I evaluated it and I said, okay, so what is the deal here? Why are, why is this not moving forward? And what I got was, if you want to affect more change, it's not ready. The market is too invested in fossil fuels. This is the late nineties. So if you want to affect change, work one consciousness at a time. Okay. So then what I chose to do was rely on my bachelor's in English literature and go into the classroom teaching whilst furthering my energy medicine and holistic health and wellness side gig giving sessions and getting more and more educated like in tonic herbalism and in other, uh, and teaching meditation now to the kids in the classroom. And an, I set up a uh, club with a male colleague for guy, boys that were diagnosed with ADD and ADHD, for example, still teaching meditation to adults as well. And then have, running energy medicine sessions and getting more and more training. And I remember two and a half years now into classroom teaching career, 
on a Saturday, hands her over a woman in a session. She's like a number three or four in a package of 10. And I was psyched. And so was she about the results we were getting. She was feeling a lot lighter, a lot happier. Things were getting easier in her life where there had been like consternation and, and difficult relationships. It was already starting to be more peace and ease. And so I was like, oh my God, this is great. How can I get even more robust results for my clients as my hands are over her? And around that same time, Laurie and, and listeners, I was, uh, some of you can re probably relate to this. I was looking at my checkbook pre-digital banking days and I wasn't thrilled by the balance in my checking account. So I had a master's and I was on a teacher's salary and all I wanted were basic housing, basic car, organic produce and a massage per week. Cause I did see that as uh, preventative health 201 at least. And I couldn't, I wasn't having an easy time making ends meet. And I, from having lived overseas already, I, I have this sense of adventure. I have this sense of, I'm in a body. I want to explore and experience as much as possible. You know, let's see what else we can do here. And so like le reaching our human potential, which if you look at it is in great part why I left the psychology major because it was focused on what was wrong. And my first book's name or title is actually, what if there's nothing wrong? Okay, so as I'm looking and feeling the sense of being caged, not adventure, not abundant, I said, okay, around the same time, within the same month of having that experience, like, oh my God, this is great. How can I get even more robust for my clients? So a colleague turned me on. So the answer came, a colleague turned me on to the international school system. I did what I had to do through the resume into the place that it needed to be traveled to where I needed to travel. International school heads came in from all over the world. Candidates came in from all over the world in a hotel. And we, I interviewed with all these different countries throughout the morning, the afternoon, the next morning, next afternoon, same with the third day, got a bunch of job offers around the world and chose to go to Taiwan because I understood from my training in, uh, thus far that in particularly the traditional Chinese culture in Taiwan, not mainland China, they were still connected to and using the practices of Asia being the seat of understanding of how energy works and how consciousness works. So that's where I went. So I stepped into administrative roles and um, on my side, my, I still kept doing the side gig of energy medicine sessions and holistic health and wellness to both ex, fellow expats as well as local Chinese and um, traveled in my in between semesters time going to um, Thailand a lot and all throughout Southeast Asia. But on my daily, in my daily life, I was exploring by like, I would have daily runs out behind a particular monastery and I'd stop and talk to the monks. I'd explore the monastery, travel throughout Taiwan and go to different monasteries and understand how they worked with consciousness. I'd get traditional treatments like tween on massage or reflexology. I'd sit there with the chart in Chinese and I'd ask the therapist like, what does this mean? What does this mean? So I was learning about how energy flows and then uh, in how consciousness works. And ultimately in my 10th year of living over there, I went to India to get my yoga teacher training. So I also in the classroom incorporated global, I created a course called Global Psychology. So I was aware the Dalai Lama was doing these biannual summits with Western psychologists and neuroscientists. And um, the, he would produce text out of each of these um, summits. And so I used those in the intro to uh, Psych 101 uh, as the text for this course I created, Global Psychology. And it was interesting to revisit intro uh, to psych 101 that all colleges and universities use after the experiences of having meditated by that point for at least uh, 15 years and teaching it and seeing the changes in my system from the energy medicine as well. And so then they asked me to teach AP psych. So I was staying straddling the West and the East. And one of the things that I realized in my 10th year when I was, as I was writing what had started as my dissertation, because I have a PhD as a holistic life coach, it started as my dissertation, but it clearly wanted to be more. And so I let it, it became my first book, What If There's Nothing Wrong, that I wrote in these traditional tea houses in Taiwan. So I'd do my job and then I would go to the gym and then I would throw my stuff down and then I would take my scooter and go to this traditional tea house and be there till like 2 a.m. writing um, every night. And so I realized if people in the West only understood the value of working with in our own consciousness and that there is a science to it in the subtle energy system, there would be so much more thriving and so much less suffering. 
So I came back to the States with that mission. And so that's, I dropped the classroom teaching in administrative career and have taken this work full time and have been doing it full time since 2010. Um, and so here I am today. Mm. And where did you land? Where do you live now? West Coast. So I'm right on the coast. coast of Mexico, yeah. Like, did, what one, Boston, Tampa, or San Fran? <laughs> oh, I've increasingly gone into more and more tropical climates. I will not go back to the cold. I love to ski still, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Southern Cal, I guess. I don't have any interest in living in California. I love that state, but I have no interest in the property taxes and the rate cost of living and what it requires to live in California. I love it. I have many people in my programs from California, but like my roommate that I moved out from um, Massachusetts to California with, we stopped in Colorado to, for ski season for six months and, and worked there and did a ski season, which was fabulous. She, um, left San Francisco after wanting to buy a house and uh, with the money that she wouldn't have even bought one house and there, she came here to Tampa Bay and bought two. Mm. Mm. She's yeah. Still, yeah. So yeah. So you're, also, you're in Tampa. I'm sorry. I can't, I, I'm not following where you are. I'm in Florida on the West coast of Florida. On the West coast of Florida. Okay. Okay. So I'm still, staying for the month of February on the East coast of Florida. So I'm yeah. in St. Augustine. Yeah. Oh, lovely. That's such a historic place. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little chilly right now, but it's okay. It's warmer than where I, I was in Virginia. So yeah. Virginia Beach or Virginia? Uh, I live in Charlottesville. So kind of a college town center ish center ish of Virginia. I'm from you the have, DC area. So you have good springs there. Good all natural. Yes. Good seasons. There. Good seasons. But guess where I'm from? I mean, like, from, from. guess, guess where I'm I from, from springs. I mean, water springs you have oh, water. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I know there's some waterfalls yeah. and stuff. I haven't hiked much there, but I should, cause I know it's lovely. I've heard that there's, there's this place called blue something. It's a yes. Hike. yes. Yes. And then there's, but there's good springs too that are healing. Um, oh. you go, like I had a skin eruption and um, I got bit by a spider and it didn't go away easily. And so I ultimately went to Ischia, Italy. It's an island off the West coast of Italy, um, just West of Naples. And I lived there for a month and all over the island, there were different um, natural mineral springs and mm -hmm. each one took care of different things. Like if you had a gynecological issue, you went to the one in the Southwest. <laughs> If you had skin issue, you went to the one in the northeast. If you had a foot issue, you went to the one in the northwest. And so I went to the springs for the skin and it got, it went away. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's neat. Yeah. I, we have some springs real close to us, like in West Virginia too. Yeah, like, it's so fascinating to go there and like, yeah. you, and it's like steaming hot water yes. coming Steam out. More. Yes. It's yeah. crazy. Well, it's they so used crazy. to have those spas that they had in the olden days there. Yeah. That's yes. what, that's like, was the healing place to go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's just, it's, so Virginia is one of the great places in our country, Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. That, we were there. We were there in Little Rock. Oh, fascinating place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, sorry, my dog is barking because some people came home. Uh, so I had to question, uh, cause you were so like just telling your story, which was so great. A lot, of, a lot of, we covered a lot of miles, in that. <laughs> but, um, who did you teach? So when you said you went over to Asia and you had students and you were teaching, were they Taiwanese? Or were, were they a mix that's of... one of the questions? Um, good listening. Uh, so in the international school system, it's typically um, kids of either multinational CEOs that are living as expats and they want the, or it's um, like in my school in particular in Taiwan. And then I also taught a bit in Istanbul. They're either like the, well, I want to say well-to-do and elitist, and that's not totally accurate. But they want they're, they're focusing their kids to get uh, degrees in America at American universities. So we run on an American curriculum, Got and it. so the kids I was teaching, a lot of them were born in the states. Their parents had come over for their masters or graduate work, and then they or postdoctoral work, and then they got their first employment over here. Kids were born, started in the American school system. Some so as I stood there teaching in different classes. I had a range of kids who spoke fluent English were way more Americanized than they were traditional Chinese. And then others who had come back in kindergarten and were very traditionally Chinese, but expected to be fluent in English and targeted mm -hmm. for going to the States for their university. So, and they would all be like mostly Ivy leagues, et cetera. So yeah. it was a very, yeah. And they would like 
I could tell you more stories, but can Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. One of the things that I'm picking up from you, which I found was interesting is, you know, we we're talking about when you were in Tampa the first time and you were with that boyfriend you had, you seem like a very much a free spirit and you don't want to be tied down. So like, did you, did you like finally just go off on your own or yes. did, yeah. Cause it was that, was that situation holding you back a bit? Do you think there was oh. part of, no, no. So yeah. Okay. So you, when it, when it aged to what it needed to age to, and you were ready to make a move, then you went over, did you, and you went by yourself over to Taiwan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I that, that's when sometimes I look back at my life and I think I was always wanting to be attached to somebody and it, it and in some ways it kept me stifled then if you just like don't worry about that stuff but yeah. you know you always want to like you know have really the, self-aware the, yeah yeah well, I mean that's one of the things that I the reason why when we were talking before we hit record it's one of the reasons why I told my story in the uh, detail that I did because I don't make typical choices and so by giving you the wide range of uh, examples you can see that and so I know that there's a way to live where and I work with people all the time on this, like my latest book, I have four books, three of them are number one international bestsellers. This one is the Dragon Master Dragon Crate, Master Crate Tricks. Conversation hmm. with a female spiritual teacher for these new times. And uh, in that- we'll put, we'll put all that stuff in the show notes so people can look at it. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, all four books are available on Amazon. Um, the first half of the book talks about it's uh, based on one of my many students. So they meet me in Glastonbury, UK and for their trainings, depending on what level they're in. And we do different things as they get attuned in set up within their consciousness and in their energy system to be able to become increasingly more heart aligned and the mind quiets. And so in the traditional Chinese and yogic culture, both cultures, they both believe that the spirit resides in the heart chakra. And so one of the ways to translate that for your listeners is if you're, if you're uplifted about an option that you could choose, or you have some excitement, and it could even feel a little bit like nervousness once you say yes to it and commit to it. But if you have like a lighter feeling in your heart, um, that's your guidance telling you to go for it. So intuition isn't like this big unwieldy thing only um, that, you know, it's seen through the third eye and you get these images and all of that noise. It's just simply what lights your heart up doing that. And so I say this because as they, the stories in each beginning chapter are her in the community of students, getting trained with them, interacting with them, getting taken to sacred sites, getting taken to stone circles, getting the training. And it's really fun. Um, it's a mystery because she's going there wrestling with the question of, should I stay or go in her marriage? The second half of each chapter is a Q and A with me. It's kind of like in that yogic guru format, like Osho did and a lot of the yogic uh, gurus have done where it's questions from the students and then the um, teacher responds. And so they're taken actually from questions that my students have given me. And one of them that is in there is not about like, how do I astral project or how do I like connect with the angels? All of my work is about grounding in the body and being aware of your thoughts, releasing more of the back of the house consciousness that's typically blocked and inaccessible at the sub and unconscious levels. So you can make more conscious choices and live up to your fullest potential. And so the question, it, one of them that is coming from what you just said was, how do I stop caring so much about what other people think of me? And so if we didn't, we might be less needing of that kind of life that other people look to at a glance and superficially point to and say that's success you know, the marriage, the 2.2 kids, the house of a certain square footage, the car of a certain type, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it's, um, I am a free spirit. Um, and I, I, I don't, I know that in my late teens, Lori, I, I, there were a couple of times I chose against my guidance. I chose against my inner knowing and I, in chaos resulted mm -hmm. and, and 
So I just learned early on, you have a really strong guiding voice and thou must listen to it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> So can you talk to me? Cause you know, you're talking, you talk about like vibrating up or, you know, that, that whole thing uh, that I, I don't know that my audience really understands the vibe that, that the human body, like we are made up of atoms that have this energy to them. And I'd love to hear your take on when you're around people that have a lower vibrational, you know, frequency versus like when you're putting, like, I've always been really super positive and like super happy. I mean, unfortunately I had a mother who was always very, um, I, I think some of it's genetic, but I think some of it's just being around somebody who's always looking at the glass half full and always saying when you're, when you present a problem, she's like, well, let's look at this as not a problem. What if it wasn't a problem? So, you know, so what, what do you know, and can you share about the, the vibration of us? Okay. So as I check my time to see how much time we have left to answer that <laughs> <laughs> part two, <laughs> um, yeah, that happens a lot. Um, the description you gave of your mom, when you said part of, it, part of it's genetic, you know, that's the whole nurture versus nature discussion and Bruce Lipton broke through with the epigenetics understanding um, in the 90s where the prior understanding was that we are doomed based on our genetics to have repeats of what's in our genetics and what he broke through as a molecular biologist he understood was wait a minute it's actually the environment the nurturing that creates so much of how we think the way we do. And so, for example, I would say what, you're, what you got was imprinted from your mother, the- um, Behavior. Yeah. So, yeah. so in the everyday life, we are making choices all the time. They're just not heard from our conscious thoughts at the conscious mind level. So, you know, when you learn to drive, and you're saying, put the car in reverse, put foot on brake, put foot, you're not doing it anymore, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that goes lodged into the subconscious. And so yeah. we're making the stats are, and I really go through this in a, the simplest way to start with this is go to my third book, Reasonable Dragons. Um, it's on, it's the one that's on Audible too. It's the only book I have that's on Audible. And so the stats are, we, every choice we make, day in and day out is accessing only about 15% of our conscious mind. So when we meditate and we're observing our thoughts, that's the conscious mind. From all my work with people throughout the years, the tens of thousands of people at this point for the decades I've done this work, I think it's more like 95% yes. of our daily choices are actually from the subconscious, meaning under our conscious mind, sub or unconscious, meaning not conscious. And so we repeat the nature of the ego mind, which is what we call it from the Buddhist in meditation and yogic practices. The nature of the ego mind is to protect us. It's given to us to help navigate the physical plane. So in Western psych, one of the things that we're taught is of our five physical senses, there's like these thresholds put over each sense so that we don't see or hear more than we can consciously feel. Because realistically, even though we're looking at this physical desk or physical cabinet, underneath all physical existence at the subatomic level, everything's operating in energy and it's a wave. And when we think something repeatedly and or with strong emotion, not a random thought, we collapse that wave that's in motion with all potential into a particle and it begins to get physicalized. So another way to say this, from a non-quantum physics point of view. And, and by the way, that shook the halls of orthodox science for over a hundred years. Einstein couldn't even shift with, oh my God. So if what you're saying is what I observe as a scientist in the laboratory, in part, this controlled study yields the result it does because of what I am perceiving and thinking and projecting into 
this controlled study. So there's something, so there's nothing really that can be purely objective. I'm involved as a part of it. And so Einstein couldn't handle that comfortably. So he went over to the work on his grand theory of everything. Um, and so where we are today now, quantum physics has the halls of orthodox science have begun to accept this. More and more people talk about this. But here's a traditional Chinese medical from TCM, that's the acronym for traditional Chinese medicine tenant that they've had for 5,000 years. And it's where qi goes, qi translates into vital life force energy. That's what we say in English for qi. And I'm a, I teach qigong as well. Vital life force energy is what qi is. It's the same translation for qi as in reiki. It's the same translation for prana in the yogic world in practices. So where qi goes, where energy goes, blood follows. Meaning the physical follows the energy. And what I add on to that nowadays is where our consciousness goes, where our focus with our consciousness goes, the energy follows and then the physical fills in. So it is an, this is in great part behind my saying, man, if people in the West only understood the science behind consciousness and subtle energy and valued it, there would be so much less suffering. Because what that implies then therefore is we are able to change. The physical. And yeah. yes, and, and, and instead of being a victim to what's happening outside of us, there is actually creation that's happening inside of us. And so we tweak and we change where the creations are showing up in a way that are causing struggle. And so then there's a whole lot of clearing. This is when I use the energy medicine or the light, which has a divine intelligence of its own. And I remember when, let me just finish that. So the light goes in and from, I, I have a really strong intuition. I have a nickname Hawkeyes. And so somebody could come to me saying, I feel blocked um, I have not been able to get pregnant and we've spent 10, and this has happened in my signature program, magic manifestation and money flow, for example. So tens and tens of thousands of dollars spent on fertility clinics and doctors and comes to me and I see where the blockage is from a holistic perspective and am able to clear it. So a chakra means it's the intersection of the mind, the body, and the spirit. The word chakra translates as wheel. That's what it means. It means wheels. So we have seven of these throughout our body. They basically run along our spinal column. Each one's connected to a major gland. The biggest gathering of another bio um, chemist, I actually want to call her, knew of the chakra system. She was studying something for a pharmaceutical company to come up with a new antidepressant. And she noticed along the spinal column where the biggest nerve ganglias were or had the biggest gathering of neuroreceptors that received messaging from the neurotransmitters in the brain the biggest gathering of these receptors of messaging were where every chakra was. So that's both of our physical body's communication systems, the chemical of the hormonal system covered and the central nervous system, the electrical system covered. So the chakra, each chakra has a part of life, an area of life covered in it. So the root chakra is more about your foundation. So if somebody was, um, neglected in child, early childhood, or they were rejected a lot in early childhood, or they felt unwanted, or they were abandoned, or in the womb, there was a lot of suffering around uh, the parents not knowing if they're going to be able to have the child or not. I mean, you're in water in the womb. It's hugely transmittable of energy in, in, in consciousness. So you absorb that in the womb. And so then your root chakra would become a little bit um, blocked in your formative years, you would end up with every chakra has a right to it. The root is at the tailbone physically and in the coccyx. And it's, um, do I have, it's, I have the right to be here. So I've seen many people not ground in their bodies live more from their heads because innately they were not wired in with, they feel like they have the right to be here. Um, I'm not saying everything happens as a child, but so much happens zero to two. We're not separate from our parents. We feel and think what they do and at two with the terrible twos. When we start going, no, no, that's the independence developing of our own ego 
personality level self. And so from two to eight, we're busy looking around saying, okay, if this is how older sister gets that yummy feeling of smile and love and hug from mom, that's how she does it. Then the, for me to get that same feeling, I need to do what she's doing. And so that could be something like um, being a good little girl and not speaking unless spoken to that conclusion that goes into the unconscious of that's how I get that yummy feeling, which then becomes a block in the throat chakra, which is in part related to communicating. I have the right to speak and be heard at the throat chakra. And so later on in life, that could become somebody has difficulty speaking up. So I, just to complete that example of the woman who couldn't get pregnant, she did get pregnant. I have another one in my program now. So there's it, going beyond just the physical existence and treating things at a physical level and understanding that we are creating the physical, in fact, by what's going on in our consciousness, particularly in what parts of our consciousness we don't hear the thoughts from, whether it's the unconscious or the subconscious. So like trauma goes into the subconscious. Then we, as we clear that, those blockages, those old incorrect conclusions out, more of this chi or vital life force energy is able to then be accessed at the conscious mind level. So that percentage increases so that in our daily lives, we start to see, because we have new space created, that that old conclusion, I have to just speak when spoken to, I shouldn't speak up, that's bad, I won't get people's approval or love. As the new space is created, like, wait a minute, the world doesn't fall apart if I speak what I'm really thinking and feeling, and I'm still loved and approved of when I speak. So the new conditioning I call, that's the half of vibrational upgrade system. It's the applied mindfulness to coach somebody into creating new neurological pathways from that new opening. And then how to repeat that. So you're developing not only new neurological pathways with new choices available, new behaviors and new life ensues. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you're just a wealth of information. I tell you, I, I, I could sit here and go on for another two hours, I think, uh, and I have more questions for you. So maybe we'll have to do a part two because I want to, I want to dig into some other stuff. Um, but we need to close up the, this episode. So, yeah. So I would love to know what living a, not your average life means to you because clearly you've lived a very, not your average life, but if you come to, you know, let's put it on, like, say you're working with a client and they come in and they're living a very, you know, not, I would say average in, in, in maybe from your perspective and what you do, maybe a very blocked where they're not like leaning into their intuitive self or their higher self. Um, how do they, what, what, what would you advice would you give them for stepping into that? Not your average life that you have clearly been attuned to since you were a very small child. So the first thing that they get is um, my chakra series where, so the first thing really is get clearing, listening, listen to these clearings and activations. So the first thing is, is to go right at their blocks. And then once, and so if they're an in-person or a remote client in one-on-one -on -one capacity, it's let's get, let's get the um, energy and light right into your system. So it's not relying on me, it's going right to consciousness or, the, or in, in the consciousness, the light, the chi, the vital life force energy has in, at every core, the divine intelligence. It knows what to do. I'm not the one deciding. Somebody comes to me with chronic back pain. I teach this to my students as well as I have seen this over and over again. People who come to me and do with chronic back pain and I'm working on their knees. Why am I working on their knees? Why am I not being guided to just work on their, do the hand position for the lower back? Because they're, the divine intelligence within the light knows what to prioritize. And so we need to support the knees because they've been taking the hit mm. when the back went weak. So yeah. first, yeah, so- you so understanding the seven chakras is kind of like the first step. No, and no, no, no. Um, just you could go to, I mean, you could go to my website, allisonjk.com or vibrationalupgrade.com. You could go to the chakra series. There's lists with each chakra that lists the different blocks that are typical. And then there's sample clearings and activations. You could go and self-assess there and you uh -huh. could the series. Oh, that's but awesome. What I'm saying is, is, the first thing I respond to when somebody comes in is I get them using the light, the energy medicine to clear out 
where um, the blocks. And then when the light has been in their system doing enough, I then start at the right time when they're showing me they're opening into new possibilities. So the light has gotten enough work done. That's when I start the applied mindfulness coaching of, okay, so now look, you don't have to always be quiet mm -hmm. and speak what's spoken to. So then helping coach them into new, recognizing they have new choices helping them have the courage to make the new choices. It's a gradual coaching process. So I have certification in uh, um, permanent behavioral change as a part of my continuing ed as a personal trainer. I'm not going for like, you know, just, I want permanent behavioral change for people. I want people to be thriving. So I, I, I don't have a quick fix. It's a, it's a process. And so one of the things I will say though, is like, so if you have this, if What's that? This, <laughs> it's, a dis, it's a literal disruptor. Ah, um, okay. So if, I was the, like, are you, is it a fire alarm? Do you have to leave? <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it's, it's so if you're having a thought that you, you're, you're like, you actually hear and you pay attention to instead of busy with your tasks and not really listening, question it. Yeah. Just the sheer act of meditating. It's a, it's the ancient wisdom from the yoga culture, 5,000 years of the practice of observing your thinking mind means there's something in you that's beyond your thinking mind. Who is doing that observing? Yes. Yes. So that's so good. That yeah. That's one of the things I want to dig in with you because when you were in Tampa and you said that there were like things weren't opening up for you. And what made me think of that was because one of the best uh, quotes I've heard is that the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask yourself. Oh yeah. And I actually have a new group of students that I'm working with. And we, I told them that last night, I said, what I want you to start doing and be aware of is a, what thoughts are coming up? Like that are stopping questions from even like going through, like you're, you're just basically cutting off any questions by saying, I don't know, you know? And so, and then like, you know, what are, what are you, what are your questions coming up with and what are the answers within you? Because, you know, just think about, just start thinking about the questions. You don't even have to come up with good questions yet. Just think about what, how creative are your questions that you're asking yourself that, and it could be just that as simple as that not asking the right questions. So mm -hmm. that, yeah, I thought that was really interesting and we could have delved into that a little bit more, but There's so yeah. much more with that. Yeah. 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 So much more with that. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for like all the wisdom you shared in such a short time. I think you like, that was a speed read through your life. So yeah, definitely. Sorry, it's an honor visiting with you. Yes, you yeah. well. So nice meeting you. I love meeting people like you that are, Gosh, it makes me feel, or like I need to get out there more and learn more stuff. <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. Accomplished. Inspired. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much for tuning into the Not Your Average Lives podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have an Apple device. You can find free resources and learn what else I have going on at the moment that might interest you on my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you liked this episode, it would make my heart so happy if you could leave me a five-star rating. You can also add a review to let me know what you like about this podcast, which will help spread the word about it to others who need a little midlife inspiration. As always, be you, listen to your inner voice, and focus on reigniting that boss spark so you can start living your own, not your average life.